President, I rise to make a statement on the report to Parliament on the extension of the declaration of state of emergency. In particular, I want to comment on the section of the report related to the advice from the Chief Health Officer to the Minister for Health. And if you go through this 1900-page report, you can find it somewhere around the 1700-page mark. Um, in the negotiation between some of my crossbench colleagues and the government on the recent legislation to extend the state of emergency, one of the concessions that was achieved was to publish the advice from the Chief Health Officer, a summary of advice, uh, to the Minister for Health. And while I didn't support the legislation, I did support this measure, and a little bit of transparency is always appreciated, as many of my colleagues have mentioned during this sitting week. And um, for those of you that might remember, my very last question to the previous Health Minister um, in this place was around proportionality of the uh, directions and uh, in her response she pointed me to this exact advice that I'm talking about now. However, reading the advice uh, provided to the Minister in September, I was reminded of purchasing items online, something we are probably all familiar with in Melbourne now. When the products arrive, they are not always what you thought you were getting and to call it pretty thin would be generous. It includes errors, omissions and some pretty bizarre references. For example, point 53 in the September advice states, of the 19,615 confirmed coronavirus cases in Victoria, as of 8th of September, there are A, 1,178 confirmed cases within regional Victoria, which includes zero new cases today. However, this conflicts with the Department of uh, the DHHS site, which says on the 8th of September there were 1,696 active cases. And it also says that there are 18,251 confirmed active cases within metropolitan Melbourne. Um, this is clearly an error. I don't think there was ever that many active, confirmed active cases at one time. Um, section 31 states that the primary focus of the CHO's advice is on, quote, the health impacts of coronavirus to the Victorian community. And I think this goes to the heart of the issue and is an argument I've been making for several months now. The primary focus of the Chief Health Officer should be the health and well-being of the Victorian community overall. If our attempts to control the virus results in harming the overall health of Victorians, it could be the equivalent of swatting a mosquito on your hand with a 10-pound hammer. Section 81 comments on the impacts the restrictions and directions will have on mental health. There is no cost-benefit analysis here of these impacts mentioned and no evidence to suggest that they're somehow mitigating these significant impacts. Section, section 82 acknowledges the potential impact on suicide from the second wave restrictions, but does so in a very ambiguous way. Again, there is no mention about how these restrictions could be adjusted to mit mitigate the community's distress. Section 84 attempts to justify the impacts of the restrictions on the economy by referencing second quarter GDP figures from Sweden. And um, if there's any members here that uh, don't understand how absurd that is, I can arrange a briefing with an economist once we're allowed to have briefings and meet up again. Uh, Section 86 states that all of these considerations have been appropriately balanced and considered. And maybe they have, maybe they haven't. We have to trust the experts again. And I'm pretty skeptical about that, but there isn't any advice presented whatsoever about this. And in section 34, they talk about the modeling and how their supercomputer ran thousands of simulations and this sort of thing. However, it doesn't speak about anything about the, uh, the parameters that were put into this simulation, the, the types of uh, adjustments that they made to the simulation, it mentions nothing about it whatsoever. And while the advice for October, so this is the recent report that was tabled this week, it corrects some of these errors, and uh, thankfully it removes the absurd reference to Swedish GDP figures, it still contains significant omissions. It doesn't cover anything to do with the impact of the education, uh, disruption to education. It doesn't have any depth on the mental health impacts to children and human rights are completely absent. You can search the entire advice and the word human rights does not appear once. In fact, in the 2,532-page report that was tabled in Parliament this week, the word human rights appears on page 9 in a reference to the assessment that's done, this is the secret assessment, uh, to consider the implications under the Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities Act when the emergency powers are used. And to say that this whole uh, advice is disappointing is an understatement. <laughs>